one of the things those of us in the ministry almost always recognize as a harbinger of spring is the arising of new and old theories relative to the time of Passover observance, uh, the papers that begin uh, floating in almost like the swallows wafting back into Capistrano, as I said, are a sure sign that the Passover is near. Most of the time the papers arrive, however, too late for the ministers to give them any consideration prior to Passover, and then sometimes the people who submitted the paper feel slightly hard done by and say, well, you can't get anybody to listen to you anymore, et cetera, et cetera. You probably have heard something like that at some time in the past. Well, today, I, the title of what I want to go through the Bible study, which is going to be a slight digression, which I told you we would do as we uh, came on down into John, began to deal with the Passover, and we would digress into a number of subjects relevant to the Passover so that we would have the material on tape for the people who are scattered around the country uh, to study prior to the Passover. The title today is Seven Theories of the Time of Passover Observance. We'll probably have to abbreviate that to put it on the tape. But seven theories as to the time of Passover observance. That's not to imply that seven is totality in this case and that there are no more that we'll come across, but I, I do want to go through seven of the ones that I have heard over a period of time that I feel are probably dominant in some people's thinking and discuss them uh, in some detail. This Bible study will be a little more technical than some that we have gone through. I feel safe in saying that at this late date it is hopeless to resolve all the questions relevant to Passover theories. What I'm saying is that no matter how clear your explanation, no matter how thorough, no matter how many scriptures, no matter what sort of historical sources you quote, you will not be able to resolve everyone's questions relevant to the subject. There are no new scriptures left to discover. All of us have the Bible. We've all read it. I'd say most people here have read it kiver to kiver, in other words, all the way through from beginning to end, probably more than once. And uh, there just really aren't any surprises left within the scriptures themselves. Sometimes we think that maybe we can put the scriptures together in a new way. Uh, we can uh, alternatively uh, explain them a little differently. We can find some new hidden meaning in the Hebrew or the Greek. But frankly, after 2,000 years of uh, very intense study of this subject, isn't something new, something really new and dramatic that's going to revolutionize everybody's thinking and lead Protestant, Catholic, Jew, Sabbatarian, Christian, all into some sort of agreement on Passover observances, I would feel safe in saying, highly unlikely. It's also unlikely that there's going to be any new historical or archaeological discoveries left that will really have a revolutionary effect on anybody's thinking and all that. As a matter of fact, even people very close to the time concerned, the first century Christians, were divided over the subject of the observance of the Passover. So it's not surprising that 2,000 years later, people would have difficulty in really understanding for sure what happened and also the meaning of it. Probably one of the greatest hazards in all this is the win-lose philosophy that some people seem to labor under when it comes to discussing doctrinal, historical, or philosophical matters related to the Bible. The idea is that if my theory of a doctrine is not accepted, then I lost, and somebody else won. I think that's a very uh, immature attitude, frankly, for people to take, but it is one that is commonly taken when we get involved in discussions, we might even say arguments, about the Bible. Some people feel that if you and I disagree, then the logical assumption is that I believe that I'm right and I believe that you are wrong. Uh, Really, it's kind of a, uh, an unhealthy attitude to think of another person as wrong. Mistaken, yes, that perhaps he doesn't understand, yes. But that's not quite the same thing. I don't want to get involved in semantics, but it's no, no, not quite the same thing as saying that, well, you're wrong and I'm right. The chances are that both of us are in error in some degree or another uh, but are, and are mistaken. It's just that I think in some cases there is a certain consensus that has arrived at in the ministry of the church as a whole. And it, sometimes, even when that consensus is in error, there is a certain amount of time that's necessary for that consensus to change. I think one of the more interesting cases in point, well, two interesting cases in point, would be the uh, concept of the correct day for the observance of Pentecost and divorce and remarriage. There are a number of people, I'm sure, wandering around the country now who probably in private conversation say, well, I knew the truth about that years before the church did, years before Mr. Armstrong accepted it. What they don't realize is that probably there were any number of men in the ministry who had sincere questions and weren't altogether certain about certain scriptures and who continually discussed it with others and who would raise this question or that question and the discussions would proceed on through and that in the process of time a slow change began to take place in the consensus that existed among the ministry on a given subject. So those things do happen, but they do take time and there certainly is no need for any hostility on anybody's part relative to doctrines or nor any win-lose attitude, well, I lost because my, my idea was not accepted. And somebody has to give a little if we're not to split into a hundred different fragments or at least 
as many different fragments as there are different ways of looking at the time of Passover observance, because if we each decide to go off and support our theory at all costs, we're going to divide. Somebody, somewhere, has got to give. Okay, seven theories. Theory number one, the time of Passover observance. The theory is stated like this. Jesus did not actually keep the Passover, but rather a sort of Lord's Supper on the night beginning the 14th, that the correct time for Passover service was the night ending the 14th. Therefore, Jesus could not have kept the Passover. Uh, he had to have kept some other festival. The problem with this is, as I think Mr. Armstrong pointed out last week very clearly, is that the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, all violently disagree with that point of view. All of them set forth as clearly as anything possibly could be set forth, that Jesus did keep the Passover. Now, in, in, altogether implicit in this is not necessarily the question altogether of the time. The people who accept this believe that would agree with the traditional stance of the church that the time Jesus Christ did whatever it was he did with the foot washing and the bread and the wine was done the evening ending the 13th and beginning the 14th, in the nighttime portion of the 14th day of the month. They would disagree as to whether it was on a Tuesday night or a, or a Thursday night, but nevertheless would agree as to the time. But they would conclude that that was the Lord's Supper and not the Passover. But again, as has already been pointed out last week, the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John adamantly show that it was categorically the Passover that Jesus Christ kept with his disciples. Theory number two. Jesus kept the Passover, did keep the Passover, a day earlier than the Jews, on the night beginning the 14th. The 14th was a Friday. Now, the th this theory, and there's a little, another interesting little variation on this, is based upon the idea that when the Passover fell on a Friday, the Pharisees kept it on Thursday night, and the Sadducees kept it on Friday night. And that Jesus then followed the tradition of the Pharisees and kept the Passover on a Thursday night instead of on a Friday night. But by and large, I, the, there is some question as to the Pharisaic Sadducee tradition uh, even being substantiated in history. There certainly is no reference to it in the Bible, and it would be very, very difficult to try to uh, somehow uh, work that out. Theory number three, I'll want to take just a little more time on it. This one is that Jesus, following the true calendar by observation rather than calculation, kept the Passover the evening ending the true 14th. You better be careful and follow me carefully on this one. The, this idea is that there is a true calendar and a false calendar. That the false calendar is that one followed by the Jews, that they're reckoning their means of calculating the calendar rather than observing the crescent of the new moon and making the decision on that basis that that was in error, and that Jesus, rather, followed the method of looking at the new moon, seeing the crescent, and then kept the Passover at the correct time, ending the 14th day of the, of the first month. Uh, but the Jews also, on their calendar, kept it ending the 14th day of the first month, but because of their way of calculating the calendar, were a day later. Now, this is kind of an interesting thought, but there are some consequences. For one thing, this would have Jesus, who Paul tells us is our Passover, killed, not on the 14th, but on the 15th day of the month, as on this so-called true calendar. And of course, if there is such a thing, if God in heaven has this time set apart as holy by observation and not by calculation, then the time, the correct time for killing the Passover would be the time, then I guess, when Jesus died, and that would be the real 14th day of the month, or the way this reckoning would be, it would be on the 15th day of the month. Then Jesus was not killed on the Passover at all. And Paul's statement, Christ our Passover, loses a certain amount of, of its strength in trying to connect the, the death of Jesus Christ with the Passover lamb itself. It seems odd, too, that there would be no mention of what would amount to a serious variation in custom. That Jesus uh, would have taught his disciples, now the Jews are in error in calculating the calendar. That uh, it, the true way is to go out and observe the crescent of the new moon, and then we observe it in this way. One would, this I don't understand is an argument from silence, but it seems that on something this critical, some conversation would have been had about this particular thing. At all other times, and this is, I think, perhaps more significant, Jesus observed the festivals at the same time as the Jews, and John repeatedly in his Gospels even refers to them as the Feast of the Jews, so there can be no mistake that they were considering the Jewish calculation of the calendar as the determining factor in the holy days that they kept. Now, it would appear that throughout his three-and-a-half-year ministry, and indeed throughout his life, 
Jesus followed the Jewish calculation of the calendar. Why would he have changed on this last occasion? Now, this is an interesting thought. Where is the scripture that explains the, the method of calculating the calendar by observation as opposed to calculation? The answer is there is none. There is no reference to it at all. It may come as a surprise to some people, but whenever you begin to study your, through the pages of your Bible, you will find absolutely no reference to the existence of a 13th month existing in the calendar. Now, for those of you who may be unfamiliar with this and think in terms of 12 months to a year, what do you mean 13th month? The Holy Day calendar, the Jewish calendar, based upon the new moon, was a lunar calendar. It was not a, a solar calendar. So that consequently, as we go through the 12-month season, and there are scriptures that refer to the 12 months in a year, actually lay out the 12 months, gives us the name of many of the months, tells us which individuals was to serve in which month. They just lay out 12 months. There is never a mention of a 13th month. But you realize very quickly that if we do this, we are gradually going to get off of the solar calendar by, what, five or six days, it seems to be, I forget the exact number, every year. Which means that the holy days are all going to move earlier every year. Somebody will say, well, fine, let's let them float. Let them work their way back around the, through the calendar. Yeah, maybe that's the way it was intended to be. Well, the fault with that is that the holy days were all oriented on, based on, connected and tied to the early and the middle and the last letter harvests in Palestine. They were harvest festivals. And somewhere connected with Pentecost and the Days of Unleavened Bread had to come the cutting of the wave sheep, remember? That had to be the first ripe grain that could only be done at a certain time of the year. Therefore, that calendar had to be adjusted to the sun. So it became what is called, and technically, a, a, sol lunar tal a, a lunar solar calendar, or a solar lunar, I forget how they actually say it. So that there has to be an adjustment. Now, we make what it would, you would call an er intercalation in our calendar every fourth year. We call it leap year, right? We add one more day in ours every fourth year so that we keep ours working out close to right. I say close to right because if you've noticed since you were perhaps, I don't know how old you are, but if you've noticed since, since I was just a tad, I can remember that the, 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 uh, the day of the spring of the vernal equinox has been moving a little bit. Actually, it's not the same as it was when I was just a boy, the first day of spring. And so I began to realize, well, no, our calendar is not even correct. But sooner or later, we're going to have to make another adjustment to keep our spring somewhere where it is. I don't know when it would come, uh, but it is recognized that, that that will have to be done. It has been done, I think, in, uh, historically in the past. So we, uh, we take a look at all this. We realize then that, that in Israel they had to do an intercalation of some kind to keep their calendar from getting off. Well, their custom was not to do something every fourth year, but every so often they would add a 13th or intercalary month to bring the calendar back into line and make it what it ought to be. Now, where do you find in the Bible the 13th month or the concept of intercalation, or you know, intercalation, the putting of a month into the calendar. It's not there. There is no reference to it at all. However, there is an interesting reference that I think many of us, uh, perhaps, we've read it, we understand it, I'm sure, but may have overlooked the significance of it. I think I've explained elsewhere that uh, that the law that there is a tendency on our part to look at the law of God as a giant monolith that, uh, you know, cannot even be scratched. It is absolutely unalterable, unchangeable, uh, subject to no interpretation, that it has the answer to every question. That is, no, nothing could be further from the truth. And anyone who has read the law should really understand that, that you don't get two paragraphs into it, you have about a half a dozen questions already. Well, what if this, and what if that, and suppose this should happen, then what do we do there? Well, that was all taken care of. In Deuteronomy 17 and verse 8, if there arise a matter too hard for you in judgment between blood and blood, between plea and plea, and between stroke and stroke, being matters of controversy within your gates, then shall you arise and get you up to the place which the Lord your God shall choose. You shall come unto the priests, the Levites, and unto the judge that shall be in those days, and inquire. And they shall show you the sentence of judgment. And you shall do according to the sentence which they of the place uh, which the Lord your God shall cho choose shall show you. And you shall observe to do according to all that they inform you, according to the sentence of the law that they shall teach you. What does this mean? It means that there was an administration set up to answer questions about the law, about things that must be done, about uh, there's a question of what is the punishment we meet out in this particular situation. I know the law says this, but was it covering this particular situation? The priests, the Levites, and a certain category of people who might not have been a priest or a Levite called a judge were to make decisions administratively about the law of God. We could probably find our way through the, you know, go back to the book of Exodus and look at these things having to do with uh, mixed fabrics as an interesting case in point. 
something that, you know, they, they just mentioned linen and, and wool or that, that is, as two categories. And then any number of questions could arise about other kinds of fabrics. And when we get down to modern times, to synthetic fa uh, fabrics, more questions could have arisen among those who believe they should adhere strictly to that law. The fact of the matter is that all of these items of the law were subject to interpretation. By and large, most people did not even need to ask about most things, because if they pertained to a person individually, he could make his own decision. Now, if he did ask, what, what was he supposed to do? Well, it says in the middle of verse 11, it says, You shall not decline from the sentence which they shall show you to the right hand or to the left. And the man that will do presumptuously and will not hearken to the priest that stands to minister before the Lord your God or to the judge, even that man shall die, and you shall put away the evil from Israel. And the people will hear and fear and do no more presumptuously. In other words, judicial decisions made by the priests and the judges, when they were inquired of, took on all the moral force of the law of God, as much force, as much effectiveness as the Ten Commandments had. Now bear in mind, if a person decided it was not too hard for him to judge, but he didn't have to ask. And having asked, he was bound by the decision. That's fair. It's just like binding arbitration. We do that sort of thing today, where a union uh, and a man management will agree to be bound by the decisions of a third party. They, they say, better too hard. They can't sort it out. They're, they're, they're deadlocked. All right? They agree by contract to binding arbitration, which means then that the arbitrator's decision takes on all the force of, of the law of the land for both parties who submitted that matter to binding arbitration. That's exactly what this is here. Who said these words of Deuteronomy 17, 8 through 12? Well, the eternal, Yahweh. The one that you and I have come to know as Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the one that spoke these words that we read here. Now, it is interesting, when we come down to the New Testament, and if you turn to Matthew 16, an old familiar scripture that's been much used and abused, actually we have a similar type of circumstance that is to exist in the church. I say unto you, verse 18, that you are Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That, that script verse is another subject. And I will give unto you, not just to Peter, but to all of them, as another scripture would show, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, I, I've, I've looked at this many times, looked at it in the Greek and the original, and I really honestly feel that the Baptist approach to this is saying, whatever you bind on earth shall be having been bound in heaven, which means that you can only bind on earth what's bound in heaven. The problem with this, how do I know what's been bound in heaven? That, that really doesn't fit the meaning, or actually the original Greek in this case at all, really does not submit itself to that. Actually, the King James Version is as good a translation as you're going to find. I think what we are finding here is just a New Testament statement of the same underlying principle that existed back in Deuteronomy 17, that just because you receive the Holy Spirit doesn't mean you're going to have the answer to every question you're going to face. But if there is a matter you can't answer, and you do go to someone who is in, in the ministry for advice, then, and then you admitted you didn't know the answer before, and then when you are given an answer, then you really should follow that advice, that instruction that, that he shows you out of the Word of God, rather than going the other way. Again, you don't have to ask, but when you have asked, then you really ought to follow it. But I think a little more than that, I think we need to understand that some administrative authority is required in matters requiring collective action. The ministry should very rarely be find themselves in the position of trying to make binding and loosing decisions for individuals who are struggling with a question that they don't know how to resolve regarding whether I should do this or take that job or marry this person or not marry this person. Really, that should be a relatively rare thing that the ministry ever find themselves involved in even discussing that sort of thing, except maybe as a, a, an elder brother giving counsel to someone who might need help. Binding decisions, oh, I hate that kind of situation. hate to get into it, because you have to take someone else's responsibility, a responsibility which with the Holy Spirit in them they ought to bear. However, there is the problem of collective action. What do you mean collective action? Well, I mean the decision about where we're going to keep the Passover. And perhaps even more to the point, when we are going to keep the Passover. And the fact of the matter is that we may find on any number of doctrinal questions relative to the Holy Days that there is a need to consider some sort of ecclesiastical authority as to when it's going to be so that we can all do the same thing. The Jews faced this question back in the early centuries of this era when they had to, as the temple was destroyed and the people were scattered abroad, and they began to realize that, that unless there were some means for Jews everywhere to be able to arrive at the calendar that you'd have Jews in Mesopotamia keeping the, the Passover at one time of the year 
and Jews in, in, in southern Africa keeping it in some other time of year in Alexandria, and the Jews in Rome might very well fall into another custom entirely based upon observation, the vagaries of weather, and the difficulties, and it seemed very important to them at the time that all of Judaism worldwide be able to arrive at a conclusion regarding the same time when this should be done. And so they published for the first time, about the fourth century, I believe, the rules that they had followed for centuries regarding the keeping of the calendar. And as a result of this, since that time, the Jews have calculated that calendar. Now, it is true, by the way, that there is a gradual variance in that calendar from the seasons that is going to have to be adjusted at some point in time. I'm answering a question that's coming up in the, in the next uh, international news when a fellow would ask, why is the Passover so much later than the vernal equinox? I thought it was to be the first uh, full moon after the vernal equinox when the Passover came. And, of course, I point out to him that the Bible says nothing about the vernal equinox. Uh, there's no discussion of it, no, uh, doesn't look at it, doesn't even consider it as, as a part of the question. And, in fact, doesn't answer the question at all. And what it does do is establish an administration, the priests and the Levites, who are to answer that type of question for the people regarding collective actions of the people as a whole in ecclesiastical and liturgical matters, which they proceeded to do. So there is some administrative authority required in matters involving collective action. Historically, the church has traditionally looked to the ecclesiastical authority of the Jews in making that determination. Jesus accepted it. Jesus followed it throughout his life and throughout his ministry. There is no reason whatsoever to feel that he deserted it on this last Passover that he observed. Uh, and we have to also realize that in the latter time, that the Church of God, the ministry of the Church of God, and of the Church of God International, the question has been asked, and the ministerial council did affirm that they felt that we should continue to follow the Jewish reckoning of the sacred calendar. There is no other unified method of going unless we decide to create some new central authority for observation or calculation of the calendar and set up a new calendar and disseminate it to all of our people. That will have a strange effect, though. It will move us away from a large body of God's people who will be doing it another way were we to do that. Perhaps we have the authority, perhaps we do not. Uh, it would be a matter for the ministerial council to, to, to meet and discuss and perhaps decide. Because, you see, this is a matter that's too hard for me in judgment. Therefore, it's got to be submitted to those to whom Jesus Christ, in whom he has put his spirit, and in whom he has put the gift of his Holy Spirit, are going to have to consider it and decide what the group of us are going to do in this particular matter. Not only does there have to be some administrative uh, authority required in collective action, that authority has got to be backed up. And that's what Jesus says. In Matthew 16, it's what he also told Moses in Deuteronomy 17. It was Jesus himself who gave instructions about setting up priests and judges to determine things relative to the law, including the calendar. Would he himself then flaunt that authority? I think not. And as I said, the ministry had decided to continue to follow through on that line. All right, the fourth theory. This theory holds that Jesus kept the Passover at the correct time with the Jews. At the end of Thursday the 14th, Friday the 15th was the first day of unleavened bread and the day of the, of the crucifixion. Edersheim advances this theory in his life, not, not the life and times, but the, the temple. It's rites and services in the time of Christ. And I think uh, Robertson's Harmony of the Gospel also advances the same theory. Mr. Ted Armstrong discussed that at some length last week. It's worth noting, I think, at this problem, I mean, I'm sorry, at this juncture, a couple of, I think, important scriptures. Matthew 26 is the first one I want us to turn to. Matthew 26, verse 1. It came to pass, when Jesus had finished all these things, he said to his disciples, You know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is to be betrayed to be crucified. At the same time, assembled the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people to the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and they consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety and kill him. But, they said, not on the feast day lest there be an uproar among the people. Oh. So the crucifixion of Jesus was not to take place on the feast day. Now, some people have felt that they were going to do it, that they were going to delay until after the feast, and that Judas came along and volunteered, and that gave them their opportunity. However, I think the wording of this seems to imply more, it doesn't imply a determination to put it off, but a determination to get it done. The only criterion being we don't want to do it on the feast day. Because if we do that, there's going to be a giant uproar among the people. Why would there be a giant uproar on the feast day more than some other day? If it were not for the fact that there should not have been executions, public executions going on, on the feast day. 
Mark, the 14th chapter, relates the same incident perhaps even a little more strongly. Mark chapter 14, verse 1. After two days was the feast of the Passover and unleavened bread. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by craft and put him to death. But they said, Not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. So there was a determination. They set out. They made up their mind. We're going to kill this man. All right. Now then, I think, if they, and they wanted him out of the way before the feast. Now let's turn back to John, the 18th chapter. John chapter 18 and verse 28. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas into the hall of judgment, and it was early. This is the morning after his arrest. They themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. All right, we are then at this point still before the Passover. Jesus is arrested. Now, there is a certain argument that is advanced. You might wonder how in the world would a man like Edersheim overlook such an obvious scripture. He doesn't overlook it at all. But what he does point out, and he points it out quite correctly, is that the, the, the term Passover had come to be applied not only to the day of Passover itself, but to the whole feast. As a matter of fact, you'll find Jews referring this, to this day to the Feast of Passover, and by that they mean the whole seven-day period, or they'll refer to the seven days of Passover. And so his argument is that what they, it means here, they should not be defiled, but they might eat the Passover, is any given meal that might occur during the Passover. You'll have to judge for yourself whether you can buy that or not. But that, when you consider, first of all, that these men had intended and, and made up their mind they wanted Jesus dead, but not on the holy day. We are here on the preparation for a holy day. They don't enter in because they don't want to be defiled, so they can keep the Passover. The whole thing all focuses in on the fact that we are on the day before the first day of unleavened bread, not on the feast day itself when Jesus has been arrested and is about to be crucified. Turning on over to after the crucifixion, verse 31 of chapter 19. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was an high day. There is no reason for that statement to be in there at all unless that day was the first day of unleavened bread. Otherwise, all he needed to say was they wanted the bodies off of there so the bodies should not remain up there on the Sabbath day. Period. But it goes on to say that that Sabbath was a high day. Now, the argument again from Edersheim would be, well, because this was the day of the wave sheath, and even the weekly Sabbath during the, 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 the festival was an important Sabbath, and it therefore was a high day. Well, you can, again, judge that for yourself if you wish to. But whenever you put together the determination that these men had to put Christ to death, that they did not want to do it on the feast day, that they had him arrested when they did, and that they themselves were still waiting to eat the Passover, and they wanted the bodies off the cross before the Sabbath, which was a high day, you're left with an almost impossible situation if you try to understand that Jesus kept the Passover at the same time as the Jews did and was crucified on the 15th, not the 14th. It just will not fit the Scriptures. In the light of the above, this, I mean, or sorry, then we come to a couple of Scriptures, I think, which caused people to make that, that decision. Mark 14. And verse 12, I think probably the best one, Matthew 26, verse 17, says much the same thing. And the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover, his disciples said unto him, Where will you that we go and, and prepare that you may eat the Passover? I believe in Matthew 26. Maybe I should turn to that one as well. Matthew 26 and verse 17. Now the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying to him, and so forth. Now what is interesting is that Robertson, in his harmony, and I know it's also my Englishman's Greek. Both of them make a point of, of, of saying, now, on the first day of unleavened bread, the day that they killed the Passover. And both, in both cases, they use the, term, the, ver, the preposition, on. The point they seem to be trying to make is that it was on the day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover, that the disciples came to Jesus and said, where do we prepare to keep the Passover? Now, frankly, this would be a little bit too much weight to put on a preposition especially when no preposition is present in the Greek. In fact, the King James translation is probably the best because it omits that altogether and says, now the first day of unleavened bread, the, the, the disciples came to Jesus. It says here. Now, as I said, the, 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 the translation here, the wording of it, would be a little bit heavy. And it does tend to sound that way if you just read it this way. But I think you have to understand that the Greek 
does not, well, oftentimes omits prepositions, they're not as important in the Greek as they are in English because there's not the need, apparently, uh, that, let's put it another way, Greek is not as precise as English where the use of preposition is concerned. The only differentiation that seems to be made is in the cases. And this particular statement in, in Mark is in the dative case. In fact, in Matthew it's in the dative case as well. The preposition usually inserted in order to translate into English is the preposition to, not the preposition on. I think what we have is probably an elliptical expression that simply refers to the fact that as we come to the day, first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and said, we're going to go ahead and do this. This is the way I have to understand it. Because you have a clear conflict between their understanding of Mark 14, 12, and the sequence of events having to do with the Jews who did not enter into the judgment hall of Pilate that they might keep the Passover, the scriptures that all focus in on the fact that Jesus could not have been killed on the first day of unleavened, that is, I mean, sorry, on the first day of unleavened bread, yes, the 15th day of the month. I think that combination of things put together is pretty conclusive. And trying to put that much weight on the structure of uh, uh, the scripture in Mark, four, Mark uh, 14, 12 and Matthew 26, 17, uh, is a little bit shaky business, as I said, especially when the preposition is absent in the Greek. And really, the preposition in Mark has more to do with identifying the time that the Passover is killed than it does with the time that the disciples make the statement to Jesus. It's rather an involved discussion, a little hard to go into unless you have a little bit of knowledge of the Greek. It is a little bit of fun when someone does know the Greek, sit down and go through those scriptures and take a look at how they are worded. Greek is a peculiar language, a very elliptical language. By elliptical, I mean oftentimes words are not inserted but are understood, and the translator has to insert them. That's why when you read through your Bible, you find so many italicized words. And for those of you who didn't know that, uh, the words that you find in your King James Bible that are italicized are missing from the Greek. They are not found in the Greek, and the, the translator has inserted those words because he feels they are necessary for you to understand what is said in English. The fifth theory regarding the Passover revolves around Matthew 14, 12 again. This argument is that Jesus again had to keep the Passover on the correct date. That was at the end of the 14th. And the argument is that the true Feast of Unleavened Bread includes the 14th through the 20th rather than the 15th through the 21st. I don't know if you've ever run across this one or not because it has not achieved very wide uh, acceptance or uh, popularity. But the idea is that the 14th day of the month is the first day of unleavened bread, is an annual Sabbath, and that was the day Jesus kept the, uh, the Passover. The problem with that is fairly easily resolved if you go back to Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. Turn back there with me. I want to be sure and cover this one, even though it has not received very wide disposition because it may come to you between now and the Passover, and I'd like you to be equipped for it. Uh, Leviticus 23 and verse 6, actually beginning in verse 4. These are the feasts of the Lord, even the holy convocations, which you shall proclaim in their seasons. In the fourteenth day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. And on the fifteenth day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread to the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. I don't know why anyone would have a, a lot of trouble with that, because it seems clear enough that the first day of unleavened bread is the fifteenth. It says, in the first day, you'll have a holy convocation, do no servile work. Again, you offer an offering by fire. We're also told that uh, in the first day and the seventh day elsewhere that you shall have a holy convocation. Numbers 28, another uh, scripture relevant to this. Numbers 28 and verse 16. And the fourteenth day of the first month is the Passover of the Lord. And in the fifteenth day of this month is the feast. Seven days shall unleavened bread be eaten. In the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no manner of servile work therein. You shall offer a sacrifice made by fire for a burnt offering to the Lord. And it goes on to describe all the things that had to be done. Later on in Numbers 33, another uh, uh, oblique reference to it. Numbers 33 and verse 3, They departed from Ramses in the first month, on the fifteenth day of the first month, on the morrow after the Passover, the children of Israel went out with a high hand in the sight of all the Egyptians. They went out of Egypt on the fifteenth. And the commemoration of the 15th day of the month, the days of unleavened bread, uh, or the beginning of the days of unleavened bread, is their departure out of Egypt in haste, taking their bread with them unleavened in their troughs. Uh, it seems impossible that someone would really arrive at that argument, and the, the, the argument is based entirely on Mark 14 and Matthew 26, the references to the fact that the, the day the Passover was killed was the first day of unleavened bread. It is so easily explained, though, that that, that simply was the usage of the time. That because of the time in which the leavening was put out of people's homes, all of it, in fact, was to be destroyed by noon of that day, that by usage that came to be the first day of unleavened bread. And sure, in fact, many of the people had finished their search 
for leavening on the 13th. By the, by the time the sun went down on the 13th, they had actually gotten it all together in one place. In fact, I think it was the night, even on the 13th, where they went with a candle through the house, uh, searching for leavening and then getting it all out of all the places and pulling it together. So that actually it was on the 14th that leavening was all out of most places in the home. So it became a day of unleavened bread. It's very easy, I think, to understand that and, and impossible, really, to make the 14th the Sabbath, which is the first day of unleavened bread. And even if you do, then you create all the other problems having to do with the day Christ was crucified being on the feast day, something the Jews were determined to avoid. So, and this also requires that the Jews have been all wrong about the calendar and, and festival arrangements, which when we understand, again, what I pointed out in Deuteronomy 17 about the, the decision-making factor in the law, seems highly unlikely, especially since Jesus confirmed their calendar by his observance of it throughout his life and his ministry. Theory number six. This is the theory that the Jews kept the Passover at the true, I'm sorry, that Jesus kept the Passover at the true Old Testament time, that the Jews were wrong in New Testament times. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, basically, it is the idea that many of us were taught for many years, that in the Old Testament, that the Passover was killed, the original Passover in Egypt, was killed in the evening at sunset, beginning the 14th day of the month, that the children of Israel stayed in their home all night on the 14th, they came out the morning of the 14th, plundered the Egyptians all day long, and then left by night on the 15th day of the month. That that was the correct time for the Passover. That the Jews, having lost their Passover tradition by non-observance throughout their, uh, their time as a nation, had by the time of Christ begun to keep the wrong time for the Passover. They had reinterpreted and begun to keep the end of the 14th or the 15th as the Passover instead. There are several problems with this theory. First, if it was true, then the true Passover lamb was killed at sunset on the 13th, and Jesus' death uh, at the time he was killed had nothing to do with the Passover lamb at all. In other words, the time of Jesus' death would have no connection with the Passover lamb, because the time the priests, the Jews, had decided to kill the Passover lamb was not the time that God had ordained that it should be done, that they were in error. Now, again, that may be something a person could debate with as to whether Jesus had to be killed strictly at that period of time. But you, have, you do lose that if you go to the conclusion that this particular way of looking at it was right. Also, I think we need to go back now to Exodus, the 12th chapter, and do a little bit of reviewing about that Old Testament Passover to be sure we understand what we're talking about. Exodus, the 12th chapter, in verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak you unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. If the household be too small for a lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of souls, every man according to his eating. You shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You will take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole congregation of Israel uh, uh, shall kill it, in the evening, or as the margin says, between the evenings. The expression in the Hebrew, between the evenings. Now, it would be nice if that expression were clearly understood and everybody knew precisely what it means. The problem is there really is no unanimity about that expression. All it means is between the two evenings. It has been variously understood. There are, of course, two evenings connected with any day. The evening that begins it and the evening that ends it, right? That's easy enough. Then there is another tra uh, traditional translation held by the, uh, the Karite Jews and the uh, Samaritans, I believe, that <clears throat> the moment of the sun going down was an evening, and then full dark was an evening, so that the expression between the evenings referred to the twilight period. This is the expression I think we were taught. Uh, this is what it meant for many years. And that happens to be what one small group of people believe that it means, but there's another large group of people that don't think it means that at all. There is another group, and I think this is the more recent Jewish uh, explanation. I say recent, I don't know how old it is that basically from the time of the going down of the sun, which means it passes its zenith and starts down into the afternoon, begins, is, is an evening, and then sundown is an evening. And the idea then is that during the afternoon period is the period of time in which the lamb was to be crucified, was to be killed. Now, what is interesting about it is, of course, that it appears that there was some modification in later years in the way the Jews did this in the exact precise moment in which the Passover was killed. A very logical reason for that. I wonder how many of you know what that reason would be, why they would be forced into some modification of the time of killing the Passover lamb. 
The reason is fairly simple. Well, the first, the first statement on it was, was, you know, very general between the evenings, and it, it allowed for a wide variety of interpretation. It may very well be that Jesus, who told them this in the first place, allowed for a wide variation in interpretation. But you see, in the original Passover, each family killed its own lamb wherever they were. You'd go out in the backyard, you'd go over the hill, you'd go around the front, wherever you wanted to go, you'd kill the lamb, you took the blood, you slapped it on the doorpost, and you went on with the preparations for your feast. Well, once the saints, they, they, they went through the period of time of the wilderness wanderings, and it appears there was a lengthy period of time when they were in the wilderness under Moses, when the Passover was not kept. When they finally came into the land and began to keep it, at that time, then the, there came to be a central sanctuary. They were no longer allowed to kill a sacrifice themselves. They couldn't kill one here or there or elsewhere. All of them had to be brought to the same place. Now, that presents a problem. And it actually forces you into a prolonged time period of killing that lamb, instead of all of them being able to kill it just moments before sunset, or maybe in the middle of the afternoon or whenever they wanted to do it. But the fact of the matter is that them having to come to the temple changed the whole uh, method of the killing of the Passover lamb. By, by the time of Jesus, there, was a, there were courses of people that lined up. The animals were killed. They were hung on hooks, uh, depending on whether it was on the Sabbath or not. In some cases, they were laid on people's uh, little... Uh, a pair of boards between two men's shoulders, but that couldn't be done on the Sabbath. They had to be put up on hooks. Uh, all kinds of customs grew up as a result of administrative decisions having to do with the way the Passover was to be observed. That's something you just can't get away from, is that as time changed, places changed, and circumstances changed, there was an administration which was authorized to make changes in the way the Passover was observed. And as long as they stayed between those two sunsets, on the 14th day of the month, the priests may have been free to move it almost anywhere in there they wished. Very important concept when you think about it. Because it would have left Jesus with the prerogative of keeping the Passover after sunset, beginning the 14th day of the month, and still be within the letter and the spirit of the law. Because the priests had made these decisions. Did the priest have the right to move it anywhere up the day they wanted to? I would have to say that if you got into a situation where there were more people than they could kill lambs in an afternoon, that they probably would have started at 10 o'clock in the morning, feeling they had the authority to make that decision, as the priests, the Levites, and the judges were authorized to do. Okay, let's you cannot tell from verse 6 exactly at what point Certainly, as an English reader, you'd never know. If it said in the evening, you'd still be kind of nonplussed. Well, now, does that mean evening is a very vague figure? Does that mean it's sunset beginning the 14th? Or does it mean just at sunset ending the 15th, 14th? Uh, and, and do I eat it on the 14th, or am I eating it on the 15th? And I don't know. You'd never know from that verse by itself. It goes on to say, they take the blood and they strike it on the two side posts, the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, bitter herbs shall they eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden it all with water, but roast with fire. His head with his legs, with the pertinence thereof, and you shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. What remains of the morning you burn with fire. Now here's how you're to eat it. With your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand, you shall eat it in haste at the Lord's Passover. Now there's the first real clue that we've had to the timing of this thing. Because we know that they got up and started moving out of Egypt on the 15th, don't we? Actually, we also know that the implication is that they started at night, although we're going to have to discuss that in a little more length later on. Why, if they are not going to actually begin to leave Egypt until sundown the following night, now this, we're, we're at the beginning of the 14th, and they're eating this in the early part of the evening of the 14th, why is it necessary for them to be their loins girded, their staff in their hand, their shoes on their feet, and they're everything ready to be bound up and just go right now if they're not going to leave until the following evening? That gives you a clue. But still, maybe that doesn't answer all of your questions that you might have on it. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast, against the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. The plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And I remember reading that and thinking, well, now, Passover, uh, that ought to take place then on the 14th. Because, you know, if he passed over them, he ought to have passed over them on the 14th because the 14th is the Passover. But that's not conclusive. 
because the lamb itself is the Passover lamb, and the name Passover may apply more to the time the lamb is killed, because that is what saves us, rather than the death angel, you know, itself passing over the house. Still inconclusive as far as that part of it is concerned. This day is a memorial. You shall keep it a feast of the Lord throughout your generations. Passing on down now, I believe, to verse 20. You shall eat nothing leavened. Uh, in all your habitations you are to eat unleavened bread. Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Draw out and take a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lentil in the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood upon the lentil and upon the two side posts, he'll pass over. You're going to observe this thing for an ordinance to you and your sons forever. It shall come to pass, when you come into the land which the Lord will, that shall give you, according as he has promised you to keep this service. And it shall come to pass, when your children shall say unto you, What do you mean by this service? Now, this gets to be rather important. You're going to say, It is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt, when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses, and the people bowed their head in worship. So they went away. And they did that. Then comes the death angel at midnight and smites all the firstborn of cattle and dungeon. Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and his servants, and there was a great cry in Egypt. And he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise up and get out. Now, you can almost conclude at that point that they rose up and started to get out at night. Although that isn't necessary from this because it says he called Moses by night. It doesn't say Moses actually, as the movie shows him, getting up and going to Pharaoh. He may not have gone to Pharaoh at all. In fact, I think probably he did not. Uh, it's probably that Pharaoh didn't see him again, but uh, unless I've lost my track of my sequence of events here. But that they actually began immediately to, to leave Egypt. Some have said that, well, you know, it's morning, it's no longer night once you pass midnight, and that's possibly true, although, again, probably not necessary, as I'll point out a little bit later. Uh, we can probably have these people staying in their homes until the sun comes up the next morning and then starting out of Egypt without violating any scripture at all, when we understand what's actually being involved with all of this. Uh, passing on down now to verse 40. Now the sojourning of the children of Israel who were in Egypt, who dwelt in Egypt, was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of 430 years, even the selfsame day it came to pass, that all the hosts of the Lord went out of the land of Egypt. It is a night to be much observed unto the Lord for bringing them out of the land of Egypt. This is that night of the Lord to be observed of all the children of Israel in their generations. Now, this is kind of an interesting statement in a lot of ways. I think we have to pause and realize they did not go out of Egypt on the 15th, technically. In reality, because in fact they had at least a seven-day march, and frankly, with all of them that were there, with the cattle and the little children and and all that they had to do, I don't know what you can expect to make in a day on foot with cattle in a cattle drive. But yet, I mean, a twenty-mile march seems to me probably to be a little bit unrealistic. Maybe they could do it. I don't know, but certainly four days, five days, but probably a week. Exactly. Who knows? Maybe there's even some connection there with the seven days of unleavened bread that uh, took them that long to get to, the, to the, the, the Red Sea, where they were trapped by Pharaoh's armies. Then they didn't literally leave. They left Ramses on the 15th. They didn't get clean out of Egypt on that day, but figuratively they did. They were free men on that night. What was it that freed them? Well, it was the death angel passing over the houses of, and, and actually uh, destroying the firstborn of Egypt. That it was that night that Pharaoh said, get up and get out. That was the night that God freed them. It was a night to be much observed. It was the night of the death angel, and it was the 15th, not the 14th, as I think will become uh, quite clear as we continue along with this one. So this was to be observed by them in all their generations. Chapter 13, verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Sanctify me all the firstborn. Whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both man and a beast, it is mine. Why is that? Remember this day in which you came out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. For by strength of hand the Lord brought you out of this place. There shall no leavened bread be eaten. Then verse 11. And it shall be when the Lord shall bring you to the land of the Canaanites, as he swore unto you by your fathers to give it to you, that you shall set apart unto the Lord all that opens the matrix. Every first thing that comes out of the beast which you have, all the males will be the Lord's. Again, the question is, why? Every firstling of an ass you're to redeem with a lamb. If you're not going to redeem it, then you break its neck. All the firstborn of man among, among your children you shall redeem. Why? It shall be when your son asks you in time to come, saying, What is this? That you shall say to him, By strength of hand, the Lord brought us out from Egypt from the house of bondage. 
And it shall come to pass when Pharaoh would hardly let us go that the Lord slew all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man, the firstborn of beast. Therefore I sacrifice to the Lord all that opens the matrix, being males. Now what is interesting to this is that this actually connects and in, in, in uh, Exodus, the 12th chapter, where it says, when your son asks you about the meal that you eat on the Passover, you are to explain to him about God's intervention in delivering you out of the land of Egypt. Here, when your son asks you about this firstborn thing, you're to explain it has to do with the Lord delivering us out of Egypt by the death of the firstborn. And when was it that they were delivered out of Egypt? It was on the 15th day of the first month. This is all important because of Deuteronomy 16, in verse 1. Deuteronomy 16, verse 1. Observe the month of Abib, and keep the Passover unto the Lord your God. For in the month of Abib, the Lord your God brought you forth out of Egypt by night. Now, wait a minute. Then what, what do you mean he brought you out of Egypt by night if they were not to go out of their houses to the morning? He freed them by killing the firstborn of Egypt. That's how. It didn't make any difference literally where they went out of Egypt because they didn't go out of Egypt that night. They left Ramses that day. But they weren't gone out of Egypt. They left Ramses, we were told, in the 15th day of the first month. <coughs> so he's not speaking literally. He's speaking figuratively. That they were released, they were free men, even though they were still inside the borders of Israel, I mean, of Egypt. Pharaoh didn't consider them totally free yet, because he went after them. He still felt, as long as they were this side of the Red Sea, that they were in Egypt and they were his, and he could go and get them and bring them back. You shall therefore sacrifice the Passover. Notice this. You are to remember this, that the Lord brought you forth out of Egypt by night, therefore you shall sacrifice the Passover. Now, I think this is important. It may seem a little tenuous at first, but when you think about it, the truth is very much there. Here again, the Passover is connected with the departure from Egypt by night. Not that the Passover is on the night of the 14th, and then the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and you were there, because otherwise it would have said, you shall remember to eat unleavened bread and have a, have a holy convocation, and a night to be much observed at the beginning of the 15th day of the first month, where the Lord brought you out of Egypt by night. He doesn't say that. He says you shall sacrifice the Passover because the Lord brought you out of Egypt by night. You might have a little bit of difficulty if you were coming from out of the blue and reading through this and understanding clearly what happened. But when you study, study it carefully, and then on top of that, you take a look at a people who century after century, generation after generation, in fact, we can say millennium after millennium, because it goes back so far, have kept this festival, have observed this festival, and have done so as far as any historical reference could ever be found at a consistent time. It really kind of flies in the face of reason to argue for a totally different method of observing the Passover. And then we have to face up to the fact that there is no indication prior to this last one that Jesus ever did anything except observe the Passover of the Jews. And when John says they went to observe the Passover of the Jews or a feast of the Jews, what in the world could he be talking about? Doing it a day earlier, with no reference ever made to the fact that the Jews had made some kind of, of colossal error. And then again, we still have got to face the fact that the one that you and I have come to know as Jesus Christ gave the priests and the Levites and the judges the authority to make such decisions relative to the calendar. Mr. Armstrong? Numbers 28, verse 4. Right. Those who, for those who are listening on the phone line, what he's saying is in number 28.4, it shows the evening and the morning type of sacrifice, and the expression at even refers to, it is the same expression between the two evenings, making it very clear that you're dealing with something that is late in the afternoon. Yes, sir. Uh, Deuteronomy 16.5, verse 6, uh, it has the reference to where you could not kill the witnesses, you know, yeah, at this place which the Lord your God shall choose to place his name, Deuteronomy 16.6, at the place he shall sacrifice the Passover at even, at the going down of the sun, at the season you came forth out of Egypt. Right. And also five, this is not the Right. So you've got to be, be looking ahead again to the problem 
of keeping where how long does it take you to do it? And of course some people have said, well the going down of the sun means from the time the sun has actually passed its zenith and begins to start down in the afternoon. That may be correct. I couldn't couldn't uh, qualify that particular expression. Uh continuing on quickly, just to uh, go on with and finish up with the seventh of the theories, uh, I should call it not not so sure this one's a theory, but for the moment. This one is the one that we have, uh, I think, come to believe in the church, and that is that Jesus kept the Passover 18 to 20 hours earlier than the Jews, that it was the Passover, it was not merely the Lord's Supper, it was that, we have come to call it that, but he himself referred to it as the Passover. He did so within the spirit and the letter of the law because it was on the 14th day of the first month. Uh, on a Tuesday night, before Wednesday the 14th, he was crucified on Wednesday the 14th, he was put in the grave before the annual High Sabbath, which was Thursday the 15th, <clears throat> three days, and three nights later, he arose at the end of the Sabbath day. I couldn't help, uh, in reading through a number of the uh, the comments that people made, the commentaries and otherwise, the uh, descriptions of it, to what extent I felt that so many of them were hung up in their understanding by the Friday crucifixion, Sunday resurrection, because not one of them admitted anywhere in the argument to any uh, variance or dent in that concept. I was rather intrigued by the fact that Dr. Samueli Bacciocchi uh, also holds, apparently, to a Friday crucifixion, Sunday resurrection, although he is a Sabbath keeper. Someday, if I ever get the chance to discuss it with him, I'd be very interested uh, in going through that particular subject to see why he, <coughs> he feels that way, because I do feel that a great deal of the misunderstanding regarding the theories of the Passover uh, has to do with that very particular point. Okay, are there any questions now or comments before we uh, break this off? Mr. Phillips. Sister Jervis, are you saying that Christ Passover on the right day? Yes. I'm saying that Christ, Christ took the Passover on the right day. That the Jews did not eat the Passover on the 15th? No, they did eat the Passover on the 15th. That they, that they, they ate Passover at the evening that ended before the 14th. Because on the 14th, they were in Pilate's judgment hall refusing to come into the court because they, didn't, they wanted, didn't want to be defiled. They wanted to eat the Passover, which they were going to eat that evening, which would have been the evening beginning the 15th. The on the 14th. Yes. The day the Passover was killed. The day the Passover was killed. Right. Okay, then, if he wasn't killed that day, he would have been thinking that he was actually eating it on the 15th. It's interesting, the question has to do with whether or not, when the Passover is eaten, we tend to focus on that, whereas in actual fact, the critical time in the, in the law is the time the Passover was killed. Now, I'm just going to say earlier, one of the theories, that the critical part of the time was eaten. That is a, a critical part to most people's thinking and as to when Jesus uh, would have eaten it as opposed to when it was killed. Uh, the idea of the Jews killing the Passover, I'm not exactly sure in my own, uh, I'd have to go back and review some of it, exactly when they ate the Passover, per se. It was killed, of course, all through the afternoon, the 14th, and I presume they could have started any time when it was ready. But I don't know. I'd have to go back and check Edersheim and some other authorities to see. Okay, now another question that's come up that is coming up is, might be much observed, is that the Passover? Uh, I, apparently so. I would have to conclude, frankly, in my own study, that, that the night to be much observed, the expressions of that uh, are the Jewish Passover. No, because partaking of the Passover involved the actual partaking of the, of the symbolic lamb, which was slain in a certain way at a certain time, a certain place, and we're not doing that. The, I think traditionally, the church was what it amounts to for us is merely a celebration of the beginning of the Festival of Unleavened Bread. Uh, I don't know to what extent uh, there is any requirement upon the church to have a feast on that night. We actually stopped that many years ago. Uh, in one sense of the word, as someone pointed out, we may be observing the New Testament Passover on the night beginning the 14th and the Jewish Passover on the night beginning the 15th, which we are not doing. You cannot observe the Jewish Passover unless, you know, except that you were going through, I know they call it the Passover without any sacrificial lamb involved in it, but it's a highly symbolic uh, supper that they do. What we are doing is not the Jewish Passover. What we are doing is a, a festival in commemoration of the departure of Israel out of Egypt, and, and that is one of the many things that that festival commemorates, but it is really a celebration of the beginning of the festival. Yes, Keith? You said Jesus did observe the No, I said he observed it on the right day. I mean, he observed the right day, therefore, the church will be correct, and he observed the Passover on the beginning of the 14th or at the end of the 14th. The, 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 I think that's a matter for the church to make a decision on. 
And the church's decision has been made to observe the Passover at the beginning of the 14th at the same time Jesus observed it. And uh, that's basically where we are today. I don't think so. That's why, if you're in the ministerial council, I would I would uh, argue very strenuously toward observing the time when Jesus observed. That's right. Jesus said, "This do as I have done unto you." So, I mean, his his instructions on the Passover. I mean, I, I, how could you keep one part of it and, and and not follow through with the rest? Someone suggested that that Jesus. This was, I guess, we call this an eighth theory, if we wish, that uh, uh, Jesus actually uh, on this one occasion moved the Passover back because he couldn't take it at the correct time and took it earlier, but it was his intention that the church continue to uh, go back to the original time and follow on through it and keep it that time. But again, uh, if Jesus could change the symbols of the Passover, why not the time? And if we are to follow his changed symbols, I could just as easily argue that, well, it was not necessary for us to continue to observe the, the bread and the wine, we should go back to the lamb, uh, as I could the other. He had the authority to change the symbols, he had the authority to change the, the time of the day. In fact, he had the authority, if he, I guess if he wanted to do it, to change the whole day. Uh, but I, don't, don't forget again, though, the responsibility that where collective action is concerned, that there is some sort of administrative authority in whatever body of people are trying to observe Jesus Christ that's going to have to make some decisions relative to the law. Okay, I don't think we're going to take any more time for any questions. Let's take a short break this time and come back in about five minutes for the service.